Got my Cali booted up, yeah it's time to hack Got the IP in scope, now I attack You likely don't know I wear a black hat Where's your sequel database, let me grab that And all the people in the place saying play that Even if your password's hashed, I'm gonna crack that Let me go and pass that back with the fast track We can think of stole a fast, I got the hash cat Even if it doesn't last, I'm gonna grab that Every kind of persistence and I will come back Responder's gonna listen and I'll get that call back Someone tell Eminem I'll never fall flat Cause I'm like all of them, I don't sound whack I can rap, I can hack, yeah all that Cause I'm like all of them I don't sound whack I can rap, I can hack, yeah, all that Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Black hoodie on, black, black hoodie on Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Get your terminals up as we listen to the song Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Black hoodie on, black, black hoodie on Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Get your terminals up as we listen to the song this verse is for the career coaches I really hope it hurts cause y'all are the real vultures You're lighting up your purse that doesn't fit our culture You're getting rich off the poor, you're a poser I told ya, if you're good you don't need the cash Now you're gonna feel my wrath I just want you to see the fact That more than half these acts are just a money trap So I will trash in raps, I don't want none of that And I will smash with passion every scummy act If you react with madness, you can run it back And if you disagree, your thinking's incomplete Because they're preying on the noobs in our industry And here's what we can do to bring their misery We can make them feel accessible for you and me All the content that we make, we do for free And we are live. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to Hacksmith Are Live. I am your host. My name is Tyler Ramsby. Yo, hope you enjoyed the sweet new opening theme song. I'll probably have that there. Well, forever, because it is an awesome song. We finished that song, I think it was last week. I think. I think it was last week, Wednesday. And we, we finished it on stream. I mixed it, mastered it, and I got that sweet lyric video made for it and just dropped it on YouTube today. So, hey, hopefully you enjoyed the song. If you haven't actually watched it on your own, you can find the standalone version of that song on my YouTube channel called uh, Black Hoodie On. And in the description of the video, there's a free download. So you can download it, listen to it, and uh, enjoy it. But, hey, y'all, really happy that you're taking the time to hang out with me. Just going to get all the streams pulled up real quick. Do want to let you know, for those of you who might be new, that I am live streaming right now to three different platforms. For some reason, YouTube one isn't live. There we go. I am live on three different platforms here. Welcome to join on whichever platform works best for you. But I am live right now on YouTube and on Twitch and on LinkedIn. I will say my primary or my main platform is YouTube. So if you have not subscribed to me on YouTube, do that now, if you're watching on another platform, it's just Tyler Ramsby on YouTube. Uh, on my YouTube page is where I'm always releasing content throughout the week. I come out with anywhere from three to five videos every single week. Some are shorter ones, some are longer ones, going into some technical detail and ethical hacking stuff, and even some non-hacking stuff, talking about mental health, and hey, coming out with rap songs as well, calling out career coaches, calling out scammers, all of that good stuff. So you haven't subscribed to me on YouTube, do that now. With that being said, Make sure I'm not missing anything on LinkedIn. We got one comment from Ryan, although it's still not popping up. Insane. So, Ryan, bro, I see your comment when I look at my notifications, but when I click the actual live stream, it's not there because LinkedIn sucks. Their live platform sucks. Why? Silliness. Anyways, Ryan, I saw your comment, said fire. Thank you for the kind words. If you are on LinkedIn, I don't see your comment. It's because freaking LinkedIn is getting the next diss song at this point for not having a working freaking comment system when i'm trying to live stream but we have nephos and daisy kitty cat over on twitch thank you all for the nice words and over on youtube let me scroll up we got tennessee tune started 14 minutes ago he was like in the waiting room hyped up we got overgrown carrot although he rated the wrong channel so he is getting banned from discord sorry overgrown carrot but pay the price my friend ray and light said yo tyler i thought it was cool you went to sti i mean technically it's stc now but yes, uh, I go to DSU right now. Are you from Sioux Falls? So I live in that area. Actually, I used to work at Southeast Tech. I used to manage uh, the IT department at Southeast Tech. 
And so, yeah, know a lot about DSU. Believe it or not, I was actually uh, I actually applied and was accepted to the master's program at DSU for cyber defense. But then I got hired as a pen tester, and I was like, I don't really need your master's degree now. I really just wanted to hack stuff. Now that I hack stuff, I'm not going back to school. But DSU is an awesome school. Good to have you here, Rain. Like, hey, if you're local, DM me on Discord. Would love to love to meet up with you. We got DJ BSEC. Uh, thank you, my friend, for jumping on again, Kevin Usman. Deadpool said, hey, Tyler, how is it going? I got my OSCP this Saturday. Any last-minute tips? All right, well, last-minute tips for the OSCP. When I approach it, you can actually watch this video. It was a while ago when I made it. But when I approach the OSCP, my first attempt, and thankfully I passed it on my first attempt, but I don't know if this will be discouraging or not. I didn't even go into my first OSCP attempt with the goal of passing the exam. My goal was to have fun. Because when it comes to the OSCP, yeah, I should make a standalone video. Let me, uh, you, you have an excellent question, Deadpool. I'm just going to start recording and we'll turn this into um, its own video. One second. So someone in chat asked this question. I thought, hey, this is an important question. I know many of you are wondering the same thing, but here's what they said. Hey, I have my OSCP on this Saturday. Any last minute tips? So I want to give those of you, you might have the OSCP coming up in a week, in two weeks. It's coming up. You feel it coming. What are my last minute tips? Well, here's a unique approach that I did, and I did pass the test on my first attempt, but that wasn't my goal. So I remember quite vividly when I was going into my first attempt at the OSCP, you need to understand the most difficult part about the OSCP is not even the technical part. Like the exam itself technically really isn't that challenging. It's a lot of enumeration and really a lot of CTF techniques. The most challenging part about the exam is the mental battle. You have 24 hours to compromise multiple multiple machines and an active directory network and trying to get through that brain fog in that 24 hours without being overwhelmed, honestly, is way more difficult than any technical challenge you're going to encounter on the exam. So here's what I did, uh, a few things. One, schedule your exam at the start of the day. Some people schedule their exam to start at like 10 o'clock at night because y'all are crazy or something. Don't do that. You are freshest in the morning. Even for those of you who aren't morning people, I'm not a morning person. Obviously, I stream late at night, but still, my mind is freshest for an exam in the morning. So, First encouragement, if you haven't scheduled the exam yet, make sure you start in the morning. Your mind is more fresh. Your mind is alert. My second piece of advice that I don't really see out there very often is when you approach the exam, don't do it with the goal of passing. Now, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but don't go into it with the goal of passing. Go into it with the goal of having fun. I kid you not, I remember posting this on LinkedIn, going up to my exam, I said, I'm taking the OSCP, my goal is not to pass the exam, my goal is to have fun and just go through the full experience. Because once again, the biggest battle is the mental battle. And if you can get over that mental hurdle, well, the technical stuff will fall into place. So as you go into your exam, figure out how you can have fun doing it. Treat it like a game. Treat it like a CTF. Treat it like this competition. Don't get frustrated. Have fun. And you'll be really impressed when you go into the OSCP with the attitude, look, I'm going to go into this. I don't know if I'm going to pass. If I don't pass, that's okay. I'm not defined by an exam. I'm not defined by a score. I'm not defined by a cert. It, it, life is not that, or that part of your life is not that important. I'm not defined by that. Instead, go into it with the determination, I am going to have fun. I'm going to experience the exam because, hey, even if you fail it, but you go into it the positive attitude and you fully experience the process of actually taking the exam, you have a much better chance of just knocking it out of the park on your second or third or fourth attempt. So that would be my advice I don't see elsewhere. Going into the exam, don't focus on passing your first time. Focus on having fun. Focus on winning that mental game. And you might be surprised at the results when you change your focus from passing to having fun and winning that mental battle. So hey, for those of you who are studying for the exam who have it coming up, I hope you find that piece of advice helpful and hey let me know how it goes when you take the exam would love to hear from you boom all right <laughs> i'll maybe throw that on youtube but that would be my advice deadpool uh, devani said came from linkedin realizing there was major lag is there major lag on linkedin or is it just like way behind I don't know. LinkedIn's live platform just isn't ideal, and I think they just haven't been doing live very long. YouTube has it down, Twitch has it down, and LinkedIn's kind of like this weird sibling in the back, like with with like one leg and one arm, trying to like follow <laughs> follow Twitch and YouTube. So sometimes it bugs out. And Dadston said, "Hey, I take my OSCP this Saturday too. Wow, we got an OSCP party. Good luck, my friend." 
Hope it goes well for you. We have a a Abdoab, if I'm saying your name right. Hello, good to have you. If Jose Alfredo, yo, 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 what's up, dude? And um, Big Beef said, how do you do, fellow hackers? I'm doing well, my friend. Neffel said, that device does work, and it was the same approach that I just took with the PMPT. Awesome. Hey, Neffels, did you pass? I think you did. I think I recognize your name. And if you did, congrats. If not, you'll get it next. Oh, you did. Okay, cool. Well, hey, round of applause, dude. PMPT is an incredible exam. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have the name recognition of the OSCP yet. But it is hands down way more realistic than the OSCP. The things you encounter both through the training and on the exam replicate a real world environment way better than the OSCP. So congratulations on passing that exam. That is awesome. All right, y'all. Okay, Neffel said, I have done RHCE and several others, and this is absolutely an awesome exam. Yeah, so kudos to TCM Security. Keep up the awesome work on the exam front of things. Get, I still don't see comments on LinkedIn. It still shows me comments, but it doesn't actually show me what the comments say. Insane. So once again, sorry if you're on LinkedIn. Join me on YouTube and Twitch if you want to chat, and uh, it'll work better that way. But okay, all right, we got another question before I dive into the technical stuff. Crypto Ghost said, have you looked into or started either the CRTO from Zero Point or any of the Hack the Box cert courses or exams? So I have looked into the Hack the Box stuff. Actually, I've done most of it. Uh, Hack the Box Academy really is an incredible platform. And I'm, I think, like 98% done with the uh, pen tester pathway on Hack the Box Academy. And I'm a pen tester and I learned a lot from that pathway. So, incredible platform. I haven't taken the exam primarily because it's a 10 day exam. And uh, I don't have, I have one more day of PTO left in my job. So, I don't have a bunch of PTO I can take. And I work for a small pen testing firm. They're not gonna give me 10 days off to take an exam. Like I'm day in, day out, I'm, I'm hands-on doing assessments. I don't, I don't have the time to take a 10 day exam. That's the only reason I haven't taken it. But I know my friend Overgrown Carrot, if he's still here, is uh, taking the, or he passed the CPTS. And from what I can read about it as well, it is an incredible exam. Dude, Rain Light, you are local? Hey, Rain Light, do you have me on Discord? DM me on Discord. <laughs> I live like 10 minutes from Arrows, dude. DM me on Discord. Would love to love to chat. Maybe me, you, and uh, one of my other local friends. We can meet up sometime. Actually, hey, Ray and Light. Very awkward to invite you on uh, on Twitch, bro. But I'm a big fan of MMA and boxing. I, I train boxing at a gym in Sioux Falls uh, every, every Thursday evening, but you may seen there's some fights coming up in this area. And I have a group of about six people going, I'm gonna buy tickets tomorrow. If you want to get together, grab some drinks, go to some fights with me. Uh, not this week, but next week, dude, DM me on discord. We can, we can hang out in two weeks, grab some food and go to some fights. But, uh, yeah, message me, dude. We'd love to love to hear from you. If you're not on discord, join the discord, go to hacksmarter.org. You can see the link for the discord. And my name on discord is my same name everywhere else. It's uh, Tyler Ramsby. So you should be able to find me. Just send me a, a direct message. Nazif said, PMPG done, CPTS coming up next week. Wish me luck. Yo, that's awesome. Let me know how it goes. Let me know what you think about the exam. And Big Beef said, prepping for a CBBH. That's a certified bug bounty hunter pathway on uh, Hack the Box. Also an incredible pathway. Oh, and Crypto Ghost, I realized I didn't answer the first part of your question. You said, have you looked into or started CRTO from zero point? So, you know, matter of fact, let's pull it up because I've only looked into it briefly. And I don't even remember what it all covers. Certified red team operator. Isn't it like a much more advanced exam? Uh, here, exams. So it would be this one, right? Let's just see what it colors. C colors, what it covers. The Red Team's Ops Exam is a practical CTF style event driven by Snap Labs. It's an assumed breach scenario, which is good because like when you do an internal pen test, nine times out of 10, that's how you start. You begin with an assumed breach. Usually you have low level AD creds or VPN access to the environment. 
by which the student must emulate an adversary using the provided threat profile as a guide. That's awesome. So they give you a threat profile even. So this, is, this isn't even a pen test exam because a pen test, you're not trying to emulate a threat, an APT, but on a red team engagement, you are trying to emulate a threat. So that's cool. This profile is available from the SNAP Lab events as soon as the exam booking is made, providing ample opportunity to familiarize oneself with the TTPs expected. If you do not already have a SNAP Labs account, one will be created in a temporary password email to you. Each machine has a flag that must be submitted on the scoreboard as a proof of progress. Students must submit at least six out of eight flags to pass. Students have a maximum allowance of 48 hours of runtime usable within a four-day window. That's kind of cool. So you can kind of pick within that four-day window. The exam VMs can be stopped at any time. Per oh, so you could like do 12-hour stop, 12-hour stop, should an extended break be required. If enough flags have been collected by the end of the four-day exam period, the red team operator badge will be awarded via email. So you don't have to write a report. You just pass it. I mean, that in some ways, that's kind of a weakness. But I suppose most people taking this exam might already be pen testers. So they don't need to learn how to write reports. Like I'm writing pen test reports constantly. And so I'm, I'm used to it. I don't need practice writing reports. That's what I do for my job when I'm done doing a pen test. But for those who might be new, I think it's always good to write a report. But it looks like on this, you just pass it and you earn it. That's That seems solid, yo. CryptoGo said, coolest part of CRTO gives you full access to Cobalt Strike. Dude, I haven't even used Cobalt Strike. Yeah, that would be cool. What do we got? Ryan said, man, I can't even drink. I'm only 19. Maybe another time, though. Okay, well, first of all, when I say drinks, bro, we, get soda. we can get soda. I go with some people who drink. I personally don't drink any type of alcohol. So if you ever hang out with me, no pressure. Uh, I haven't drank alcohol since I was like a freaking teenager or something i don't drink at all my friend you got school monday through friday work at arrows on the weekend dude that's cool yeah i would love to love to hang out with you yeah deadpool you must have noticed what i noticed the part that there's no no report cynical dunk said this is cool guys i'll just keep answering questions so y'all stop with them and then we'll do the technical stuff Cynical Dunk said, I got most of the courses from TCM for the PMPT before it changed over to the submodel. Wasn't sure if I should pursue that first or focus more on web apps for junior roles. Well, this really cool guy named Tyler Ramsby just came out with a video. Was that this week? Was that earlier this week where I said the most important skill for a junior pen tester? And spoiler alert, the most important skill for a junior pen tester is web app. So if you want to be a junior pen tester, I would encourage either the bug bounty pathway and hack the box or port swigger Academy or both together. The coolest thing about port swigger Academy is it's completely free. There are some like issues you might run into without a paid version of, of uh, burp suite, but you can still work through most of the exercises and there's no sub, there's no payment for Port Swigger Academy. So that would be my recommendation to land that junior role. Once you get into the, uh, once you get a little more skilled up on web apps, try to do maybe bug bounties or honestly, what might be better than bug bounties for your resume is CVEs. I have nine CVEs from the past year alone. So CVEs look super impressive. They're not like, you don't have to be a super elite hacker to get a CVE. I have a whole video on that. I think it's like how I got eight CVEs in two weeks. I think is the name of the video. And I walk through my entire CVE bug hunting process and open source software. And if you really focus your time, I once you go through some Portsmouth stuff, you could get your first CVE, throw that on your resume, and that'll look incredible when you're applying for those junior pen tester roles. Big Beef said, I ended up as a web app pen tester for my first role. Wish I had started with that. Yeah, me as well. Thoughts on the burp sweat? The burp suite cert is amazing. Let's actually pull that up now. It is called the BSCP through burp suite, or through port swigger, I should say. This is an incredible certification. Now, full disclaimer, I personally do not have it. I've done some of the training, but I don't have it. But I know uh, some good friends who do have it. The only reason I don't have it, y'all, is I have, if you look at my LinkedIn, I have a bunch of certs. But once I got the OSCP, I was like, man, I'm sick of doing certs. I now have a job as a pen tester. Once you land your pen testing job, I think 
I, I think it's good to do the training for certifications, but I don't think you necessarily need to sit for them. Instead, you should use that time to do security research and open source software, contribute back to the InfoSec community at large, and just focus on getting experience. But you should still do the training. But if you're not a pen tester and you want to land a role, this is an incredible cert. I know at least where I work at Rhino, if this cert is on your resume, you're gonna you're almost guaranteed an interview because of how in-depth this cert is. So this is the official cert for web security professionals from the makers of Burp Suite. Becoming a Burp Suite certified practitioner demonstrates a deep knowledge of web security vulnerabilities, and it really does. You have to know some deep stuff to get this cert, the correct mindset to exploit them, and of course, the Burp Suite skills needed to carry it out. So it walks through how to do this. I think it's only a hundred dollars for the exam yeah so it's only a hundred dollars to take the exam but don't let that mislead you you're probably not going to pass on your first attempt this exam is tough it really goes deep into your web app skills it might take you four five six attempts to pass but even then it's way cheaper than the osap and you would have to get a paid version of burp suite to take it but if you have a edu email you can do a i think a one month free trial to burp suite pro so you could use that one month free trial to take the exam and save some money there <clears throat> web 200 um that's through offsec y'all know how i feel about offsec <laughs> for 1500 dollars, tell me what did i get a bloated pdf and a desire to quit no i haven't even looked at this certification i i have a Offsec hasn't banned me yet from their platform, but I've banned myself from their platform. I, out of principle, I don't take their certs anymore. So I just, I don't know much about this cert. Might be good, might not be. Kelvin said, do junior penetration testers typically start with web app testing or get involved with active directory pen testing early on? Thanks, short and to the point for a live stream question. No, that's good, here. Man, these questions are awesome, y'all. I'll just keep doing questions for a while. Totally fine. So it all depends on the firm that you're at. Generally speaking, and I, I really want to highlight generally, this isn't true in every situation. Generally speaking, when you land a role as a junior pen tester, the vast majority of what you're going to do is web apps and APIs. The reason for that is for a, a client, so someone who is wants pen testing services, the easiest way for them to dip their foot in the water is to do a web app or an API because those are internet facing. They often have the, the wider attack surfaces that a, a real, imp, not wider, Active Directory is massive, but I mean like because they're internet facing, if they are breached, it's gonna cause a lot more damage and so uh, companies are often signing up for web apps and API pen tests. That's still a lot of what I do. Well, I do a lot of cloud now as well, uh, but a lot of what I do still is web apps and APIs. So as a junior pen tester, you spend a lot of your time doing that. My personal story is I spent a lot of time doing web apps and APIs and then slowly moved into the other stuff. So now I uh, recently got promoted. I think this was uh, five months ago. I went from a junior pen tester to a mid-level or career pen tester, but now I do web apps, APIs, mobile apps, both Android and, and iOS, internal networks, external networks, uh, AWS pen testing, Azure pen testing. Honestly, I'm probably forgetting some stuff, but if you name the assessment type, I probably do it. I can figure my way around it. But the way I do that is like when you land that first pen testing job, here's what's going to happen. You will have opportunities like your project manager or your leader or your pen test lead will be say, hey, we have this assessment coming up. Are you interested in doing it or shadowing on it? All right, here's my pro tip. Always say yes. Even if you have no idea about the technology stack, have, you feel totally overwhelmed by it, just say yes. <laughs> like the opposite of drugs, right? Just say no, no. When it comes to pen testing, just say yes, because that's how you get that experience. You cannot learn without just throwing yourself into the deep end and figuring it out. So when you land that junior pen tester role and someone's like, hey, do you want to shadow me on this AWS pen test coming up? And you're like, bro, I know nothing about cloud. No, don't say that. You say yes. I would love to learn and you just dig in. You read, you GPT stuff, you figure it out. But generally speaking, you will spend a lot of time doing web apps and APIs for that junior role. <clears throat> Jose said, can you take the burp cert course without having any other experience besides having a foundation in cybersecurity? Yes, plus it's free. 
Nazif said, how long do you think it will take for PMPT slash CPTS to get to a level of that of OSCP, i.e. HR gatekeeper? I just don't know. I don't know how all that works. You'd be better off asking Heath or someone from TCM. I will say it depends on the firm. So like if you were to apply for a job where I work at Rhino Security Labs, if we had a pen testing role open up, the, not having the OSCP isn't a disqualifier at all. Not even all of our pen testers have the OSCP because we recognize it's just a cert. It's just a piece of paper, but a lot of pen testing firms have this silly requirement for some of those things, or sometimes it's the clients who require it. But the nice thing about smaller pen testing firms is you don't have a major HR team you're going through. Like you're talking to our team when you apply for a job and we are pen testers. We know the PMPT, we know the CPTS, we know the BSCP, we know the CRTO, we know the benefit of these other certs. So if you, if we see these certs on your resume, will value them just as much, if not more, than the OSCP. But I can't, I know that's not true of all teams. Hopefully it catches on. I would, if I, if I, if I had to throw a timeline out there, I'd say, you know, five to eight years, um, we'll see a lot of improvement in that area. Deadpool said, why do we all start with mostly learning network pen testing if the job requires mostly web apps? I don't know, man. <laughs> Probably because network pen testing seems more fun because that's like the, the Mr. Robot, you know, dropping into a network, getting domain admin and pwning stuff. But it all depends on the person. I mean, I think a lot of training platforms such as Try Hack Me and Hack the Box are starting to focus a lot more on web apps, which is good. Flint said, does a CS degree, I'm guessing you mean computer science, help with getting the pen tester job? Yeah, I mean, then again, it depends on the place that you're applying. Computer science is a very good degree because it gives you a standard foundation in all things computers and, and networks and coding. But the the thing about a pen testing job, y'all, that's different than most like blue team jobs. So before I was a pen tester, I was a senior analyst um, on the blue team side at a very large bank. When you're at a very large bank, a formal organization with thousands of employees, you need a degree. And I have one. I have an associate's, a bachelor's, and a master's. And so I have all the degrees that got my foot in the door at the bank. But when it comes to a pen testing role, most pen testing firms would care less whether or not you have a degree. They don't even care if you have a high school diploma, honestly. If you have a cert, that's awesome. They want to see, can you hack? Can you put in the work? The best way to prove that is hands-on certifications like OSCP, PMPT, CRTO, things like that. Having CVEs or bug bounties that you can talk about, that you've actually earned money hacking stuff, that's the best way to land those pen testing jobs. It's a lot different than like a more formal organization on the blue team side of things. We need a pen testing cert tier ranking YouTube video. We do. I should figure out how to do that. <laughs> I'll do that sometime. All right. Jay Money said, how do you feel about the OSWE, Tyler? So... You must not have been here when I went on my rant about I, how I banned myself from OFSEC. But uh, there's people I know, actually my good friend is going through this certification. It's intense. Now, the, the biggest thing to know about the OSWE, this probably isn't going to help you with bug bounties because this is more of a white box web app penetration test. Now, if you're new to the field, new to terms, let me explain the difference between that. You have a black box penetration test, which is where you're given an IP or a web application, and you use dynamic scanning, such as tools like Burp Suite, you're proxying different requests, and you're dynamically interacting with the application to find vulnerabilities. A white box web app penetration test, you're actually given the full code base. So you're not necessarily doing dynamic testing. You're actually reading through the code. You're reading through PHP. You're reading through whatever the server-side code is, and you're looking for vulnerabilities in the code. And that's what the Web 300 teaches you is code analysis, finding vulnerabilities, and then writing manual exploits to exploit those. So it's an intense cert, and it does look awesome on a resume, but it's not going to help you necessarily with like bug bounties or even the burp suite cert because that's all dynamic black box testing. Oreo Byte said, ban yourself from OFSEC. Yeah, since they won't ban me after my rap song, I ban myself. I just don't like OFSEC. I think I think they are a predatory organization is what I think. I've heard their advanced certs are a little bit better, but I still can't get over the fact that about a year and a half, two years ago, I spent $1,500 for 90 days of lab access to a broken lab environment with shared VMs that were constantly crashing and a bloated PDF and a freaking course with a failed flag system to try to get 10 bonus points. Like 
to say I was disappointed by the money I spent and the content I got afterwards would be an understatement. So ever since then, me and Offsec, we don't we don't get along. That's why I wrote a diss song about him too. You hate the OSCP? I mean, <laughs> you can't say the OSCP is useless. The, the OSCP is still the best certification you can get to land a pen testing job, unfortunately, but it is a glorified CTF. It's a glorified CTF cert, that's a fact. I think that's what I said in my rap song. All right. Deadpool said, with your background in blue teaming, would love you to review SOC 200 OSDA. So we need to, <laughs> I need to clarify my terms. I technically have a background in blue teaming. Technically, you can call it that, but I wasn't like a true blue teamer, at least the way I see blue teamers. I wasn't doing like sims. I wasn't responding to threats for the most part. Uh, I was a senior analyst at a bank and my, my job was vulnerability management. And here's what that consisted of. It was kind of cool in some ways, but we would work with Nessus and we would be regularly running Nessus scans across, you know, thousands of hosts across the environment. And then we would look at like the most severe vulnerabilities. And then we would work on patching those across the board. We also managed like patching all of our major systems across the board. So I did a lot more of sys admin type stuff. Um, what I did is I worked with, geez, I'm blanking on the tool. It's a popular tool for active directory where you can, uh, deploy scripts all across the environment. I don't know why I'm blanking on it right now, but with that, basically what I would do is for example, unquoted service path is one thing I dealt with in a bunch of machines across the system and, oh, SCCM. Thank you. Crypto ghost. Crypto ghost gets the thing. Yeah. So I worked with this tool. Let me pull it up for context. Oh, I think they changed the name, the configuration manager. So this is what I work with was SCCM. And at least a big part of what I did is when I found these machines that were vulnerable to unquoted service paths, the cool thing about SCCM, which is another way threat actor could also abuse it if they gain access to it, but you can essentially do a check and then like a, if this is true, run this script. So I would write a PowerShell script that would go through all the machines on the network and check for an uncoded service path. And if that was true, so if, if that value uh, equaled true, then run. So you think programming language, then it would run my remediation script, which just simply added quotes around the service path. So that's a lot of what I did, responding to vulnerability management on a large enterprise environment and uh, working with like change control boards, which freaking suck to work with, trying to get anything done and just all that corporate joy, right? Of being at a larger organization. Learned a lot. People were awesome. Pen testing's better. But so that's when I say, like, I don't have true blue team, like hunting through logs, doing threat hunting, all that stuff's pretty new to me. I did vulnerability management and vulnerability remediation, which helped though really well with pen testing because I talk to orgs all the time now when I find a vulnerability of how you can remediate it. And some of the stuff that I've found in environments are things I personally have remediated in the past. All right, more questions. Kelvin said, do you foresee cloud penetration testing for AWS and Azure becoming more common and significant over time? Yes. Next question. Just kidding. Yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, there's, there's debate there, right? Like the cloud really is just someone else's computer. It only saves you money if you do it right. The cloud isn't for every organization. For some organization, it is better to have stuff on-prem. And some are going from on-prem to the cloud. Some are going from cloud back to on-prem. Some have a hybrid approach. But yeah, I think it's good to, to have that understanding. What I do is I would say cloud pen testing is probably the most, the second most popular assessment that I do behind web apps. BD said, hey, Tyler, quick question. What do you use to edit your video? I use the world famous Microsoft ClipChamp because I don't know how to edit videos. So that's what I use. Travis said, hey, Tyler, I am three years away from separating from the Air Force. I will have my bachelor's in cybersecurity within the year. What things can I do now to make myself competitive in the market? 
Hey, good question. Number one, start giving back to the community now. You can do that via GitHub, a blog, a YouTube channel, Discord, whatever it is. Start giving back to the community. Now, you might think, I don't have anything to give back. Yes, you do. I started my YouTube channel when I knew nothing and just live stream myself learning on the spot. And I still do that. That's still the, the main focus of my YouTube channel. So start giving back to the community now. Being active on LinkedIn, doing all those things will give you a good ramp when you do get out of the Air Force in three years. I am Pop G said, when did you start this hacking path? What year? I like, when did you get into cybersecurity? Well, that's a long story. I'm going to give it to you as a very short story. Back in high school, actually, I got banned from touching computers in my school, was pulled into an office. Me and my friend, who was also a penetration tester, we got pulled into the office with the superintendent, the principal, and the sheriff deputy, and they said, hey, if y'all touch computers anymore, we're going to we're gonna charge you with criminal charges. Didn't do anything super nefarious, was just more curiosity, but was banned from touching computers in high school. Thought, yo, this is cool. And uh, then I changed my career. I, I did pastoral ministry for about 10 years and then went back to IT in uh 2020 so like full-time it my first full-time job it support level one i think was 2021 i think or 2020 either way i've been it full-time about three years but i've always been interested in hacking all the way back in high school i've always kind of played around with stuff Ray and Light said, making someone write in powershell should be a sin hey well gpt will do it for you now back when i was doing it there was no chat gpt <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, ge <laughs> General, your question. All right, here's General's question on Twitch, y'all. What's the country with the least extradition agreements for cyber crimes asking for a friend? Bro, I don't know. Probably Russia. <laughs> Seems like every every cyber crime group is in Russia. I don't recommend living there, though. Agent Logan said, I like your nerdcore rap. I like the beats and the graphics. Overall, awesome. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. That was fun to make. Fun to see the video come together. Angular said, hey, Tyler, how you doing? Just popped in to say hi. What's up, Angular? I'm doing well, my friend. Hope you are doing well as well. Make sure I'm not missing anything else. All right, y'all. Should we actually do some hacking now? I think we should actually let me share my face just for a moment while I get authenticated to a few things. If you have more questions, feel free to ask them. Happy to keep answering them as I get stuff set up. No freaking wrong count. No, 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 no. Almost there, y'all. Maybe. Probably not. Two FA. Oh, sorry, or by a Mr. Question. From Pwn Labs, is there any good way to install the PowerShell command list that the Pwn Labs use for the Azure Labs? So you can follow along on Linux instead of needing a Windows VM. Also not sure how I broke Defender on my stream machine, but it's just running like at all. No, I don't think so. Now, personally, I haven't tried. Like that's, there's a few things in the pen testing world that you need, that you need Windows for. One of them is Azure. And I think the reason you need Windows for Azure is made by Microsoft. So there are certain enumeration things and certain um, PowerShell commandlets that seem to only work best in the Windows version of Azure. They don't seem to work in PowerShell core built into Linux. And I just, I'm guessing it's just because it's Microsoft. The other thing you need Windows for is uh, Active Directory pen testing. You can do 99% of that with Linux, but from my own experience doing actual pen testing, there are a handful of things that work better if you have a Windows VM that you can also spin up quickly for Active Directory. So Active Directory and Azure, it's always a good idea to have access to a Windows VM. When will you see me on Nerdcore Rap Playlist on Spotify? It's a good question. 
whenever Spotify reaches out. What I really want to do, y'all, I'm going to keep shouting this out. Anyone who has connections at DEF CON, I want to perform at DEF CON. I want to perform at least that song at DEF CON. If DEF CON won't give me a stage, we're doing it on the streets, y'all. So uh, stay tuned for that. Hack Smarter. It's going to be the Hack Smarter Con. Forget DEF CON. We the real con. Yeah, with Whitey Cracker? Heck yeah. I was just listening to that dude's music. He's an incredible artist. I don't think he raps anymore, though, Crypto Ghost. He does. First, has anyone not heard of Whitey? This guy here. He was part of Anonymous LawSec. He made the LawSec theme song. Dude, pretty incredible, incredible person. Dual Core as well as Solid. I saw Dual Core perform at, at DEF CON last year. Lots of questions. What do we got? All right, I'll answer like a few more questions, guys, and we're going to actually start hacking. I am Pop G said, do you usually learn with friends or how do you typically enhance your skills? I find it challenging to learn alone. You're watching me do it right now. Kid you not. This is how I learn. Well, now I do pen testing for a living. So like I'm learning a crazy amount of stuff every day in real client environments which is not a luxury everyone has access to. But before then, this is what I do. I just live stream while I learn. Like this is how I'm learning. It's cool that there's actually people watching, but when I started this, there was no one watching. It was me talking to my camera, pretending like people were there even though no one was there, right? So it's it's cool that people hang out with me now, but this is me learning. This is my learning process. Angular said, I like to hack, but I'm very slow at typing. I'm almost embarrassed at how low my word per minute is. What do you think I should do to increase my speed? Typing games, bro. We're always doing typing games. <laughs> Maybe we'll do some at the end of stream. Like literally do some typing games. Type racer is incredible. Um, that's one of the best ways you can improve your typing speed. For me, y'all, I just grew up on the internet at a young age. So I type fast. No one has beat me yet at these typing races games on stream. So if anyone thinks they can type faster than me, maybe we'll jump into this at the end of stream. But I believe my record was 140 something words per minute was around that in the, in the last typing race. So I got, I got skills, bro. Flint, oh, Flint just asked. That's, so I think I answered your question, Flint, at the same time you're asking it. My last time, I think it was 144 words per minute was my record on typing race. And that's that's typing accurately because it doesn't let you go on if it's not accurate. So 144 words per minute accurately, it was my record. All right. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Alex said, I'd like to thank you for your effort doing this content. It's awesome to learn from you. It's awesome that you hang out with me. Did you gain typing speed from RuneScape? That game taught me to type selling la lobs way too fast. Yeah, dude. RuneScape is on point. RuneScape also teaches you social engineering. Like I remember saying, hey, if you uh, if you type your password, RuneScape has implemented this new thing that it comes out as a or it comes out as um uh, the star character asterisk. Yeah. And then you would do it. And then someone would type their password. You very quickly log into their account, drop all their stuff, steal their account. Like that's the days of RuneScaper saying, Hey, anyone, you need me to trim your armor? Like send me, send me your, your, your full black, bro. And I'll trim the armor for you. Right. RuneScape taught you social engineering scams from the beginning. These like 10 year olds or like making a girl account and then asking the other people, Hey, do you want to be my girlfriend? And then just stealing their money and logging out. Okay. <clears throat> now, what I do want to do, y'all, let me actually ask you guys. We have a few things we can do. I was planning on going through this lab because it's more of a blue team lab and I'm always showcasing red team stuff. So we could, we could do some blue team stuff in AWS. You know, maybe actually, I think I'm going to do both. I'm not going to ask you guys. We're going to do both. I was also looking at this lab. I have zero experience with GCP or Google Cloud Platform. So I thought, let's try a GCP lab blind and see how bad we do. So 
those are, those are my two ones. I don't think this blue team one is going to take us very long. It's more of a guided lab, and it's just understanding how to prevent some of the attacks you've seen me do on stream, like some of the breaches you've seen me do on stream. This is how you can prevent someone like me from pwning your AWS environment, getting hands-on on the blue team side, and I want to showcase some more blue team stuff. So I think we're going to start our time with this lab, then we'll maybe do this lab, and then I don't know what time it will be at the night, but I also want to do some of the new Try Hack Me stuff. Try Hack Me has some a new room on cross-site scripting. They have all their 3 million subscriber celebrations as well. So a lot of content. I'll probably jump on another night this week to keep working through this. But this will be the first one. So I'm going to hit Start Poning. We'll at least get this lab on. And uh, yeah, we'll get that pulled up. Let's go ahead and start. I don't know if we'll need to take notes or not on this, but we'll go ahead and create a note for this. And if you're totally new to cloud stuff, you, you will understand what's going on, at least for the most part. I'll do my best to slow down. We'll explain everything that is going on, and I'll help you understand the thought process and some of the cloud terminology. But before we dive into it, I do have to start recording. Let me uh, start recording. We're going to do a quick introduction for YouTube. <clears throat> Check Z type, Tyler. What's Z type? Oh, it's a typing game? Type to shoot. Oh, that's cool. All right. We'll do some Z-type at the end of stream. <clears throat> All right, let me start recording. <coughs> Clear my throat, get my YouTube voice on. <clears throat> hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to do some more Pwn Labs. And hey, if you've never heard of Pwn Labs, you need to check it out. Pwn Labs is, hands down, the best platform for learning hands-on cloud security. They have labs that cover AWS, Azure and GCP. And the cool thing about these labs is you can approach many of them from a CTF approach where you just kind of stumble your way through it or a guided approach. But even for the CTF labs, they have a full written detailed walkthrough to guide you through it. And I have a lot of videos covering many of these labs. If you want to check out Pwn Labs, go to pwnlabs.io. You can set up a free account. And even without paying any money, you get full access to 30 different labs from the different cloud providers that give you a taste of the platform. And hey, if you sign up for premium, access it is around only two hundred dollars for the entire year gives you access to all the premium labs gives you access to the new thunderdome network which by the time you're watching this video on youtube that network will be out for those of you watching on stream the thunderdome network comes out in just a few days which is a red team cloud network that requires pwning aws gcp and azure a few different flags i think nine different flags in a realistic corporate environment so super excited about that i have early access to it so i can tell you from a experience it is incredible but in this video we're going to switch it up and do some blue teaming i've showcased a lot of red teaming on my channel red teaming in the cloud and red teaming pen testing is awesome but we also have to help people to know how to defend against these attacks so in this video we're going to talk about how to prevent breaches with AWS IAM Access Analyzer. Now, if you're totally new to the cloud, hang around. You're not gonna be overwhelmed. I'm gonna slow down. We're gonna take it slow. I'll take questions from those of you watching live to help understand what is going on. But many of the videos that you've seen me do where we are compromising uh, users in AWS or S3 buckets, which are kind of like storage out in the cloud of AWS, all of this could be prevented if an organization properly implements AWS IAM Access Analyzer. So this is an incredible, incredibly powerful blue team um, tool in the AWS toolbox. So we are going to learn all about it in this lab. We begin with an access key and a secret access key. Now, for those of you who might be new to AWS, this is already a little bit confusing, but an access key ID is sort of like a username and a secret access key is sort of like a password. So I'll show you how to authenticate and everything with that, but let's first set up our notes. So we have our scenario here. It's our first day as a blue team consultant for our client, huge logistics, and we have set up several AWS native services to supplement our existing security suite. Our goal is to 
set up IEM Access Analyzer, identify what issues might be present, and work to remediate them. So let's go ahead and grab that just for our notes. I'm going to pull our notes out to a separate tab, and we will do H1 Scenario, and we'll just copy the information in there. And whoops, we'll jump back. Yeah, if I can get back to Pwn Labs. We have our pl lab prerequisites, basic AWS knowledge. But hey, if you're watching this video, like I said, I will guide you through and do my best to explain it and foundational security knowledge. So our learning outcomes, here's what we want to learn. We're going to set up AWS IAM Access Analyzer to identify issues. We're going to actually do it ourselves, get hands on, and we're going to use it to remediate some identified issues. Our difficulty is beginner. Our focus is blue. And here is the real world context. And although there is a walkthrough, I'll try to do it on my own and we'll see how far we get. But here it is. As with Active Directory in an on-prem environment, it's critical to apply the principle of least privilege to IAM, which stands for Identity and Access Management in Cloud Environments. So think about I, um, <clears throat> enforcing least privilege on users in AWS. Over time, permissions can build up and object to object or identity to service control relationships can accumulate, presenting threat actors with opportunities to enter a cloud environment, gain access to sensitive information, and move laterally and vertically in pursuit of their objectives. Hardening your IAM permission assignments while still allowing productive work to be done will strengthen your overall security posture and make us a much tougher target. So let's go ahead and just copy that for our notes and we'll call this Oops, H1, real world context. There we go. The first thing to do when we're learning about a new tool is to read about it. So before we even start authenticating this stuff, which we're going to do shortly, let's just read about AWS IAM Access Analyzer and understand from the actual docs what it does and why we want to use it. So why IAM Access Analyzer? Well, achieving least privilege is a continual journey, blah, blah. It guides us toward least privilege by providing capabilities, I'll zoom in, to set, verify, and refine permissions. It'll actually tell you like, hey, here are some issues in your environment. Here are some possible ways that you can remediate it and uh, get to work. So we can apply least privilege, we can review access is kind of what I'm talking about. We have permission refinement, validate IAM policies, and automate IAM policy reviews. We have our different use cases here, but I don't know about you guys. When it comes to learning a new tool, you can read all about it. The best way to learn it is to get hands on with it. So let's jump over to the lab and let's first set up our access. So I shared before the access key ID in AWS is sort of like a username and the secret access key is sort of like a password. So our first step is just authenticating to our AWS environment. And the way we can do that is AWS configure. We can give it a profile. So I'm just going to give it a profile. We'll just call it, I'm gonna call it Poln Labs, even though I know I already have a Poln Labs profile. And it's going to ask us, ask us for an access key ID. So it's going to grab our access key ID right there, and we will paste it in. It's going to ask us for our secret. We'll copy that, and I'm going to paste it in. And our region name can be anything. Well, not anything. It can be any of the regions where your resources are located. I think the resources for this lab is US West 2, I think. So we'll just do US West 2. And now that we have authenticated, we want to say check is it actually working? So in Linux, you can do a who am I that tells you, hey, this is your user in this Linux VM or in this Linux machine. Well, in AWS, they have to overcomplicate it because that's what they're good at. So we have to type AWS STS get caller identity profile and then pass it our profile. And there we go. We do have access to it and we will go ahead and copy that for our notes so we know what access we have as our blue team. So we'll just call this access code block and we'll do that and we'll change this to bash. Okay, there we go. So we are the user security user and we will actually, I was going to try this blind, but I believe this, this lab is not meant to be done as a CTF. And you, you can actually see this right here. So when you're working through a lab from Poem Labs, they let you know, hey, is it a good idea to approach this blind or is it not? So you can think about the difference between a try hack me challenge room and a try hack me 
guided room. When you're on Pone Labs, if you see this at the top, not suitable for a CTF approach, it's more of a guided room. Whereas if it says suitable for a CTF approach, it's more of a challenge room. So it's just a good idea to make sure you know what you're paying attention to. So let's go through this entire walkthrough together. I will go slowly and we will try to do this. Let me zoom out a little bit. So I already configured my account. And now we are going to set our password. And the reason for that is we're going to use the AWS council. So for this lab, we've been doing a lot of stuff from the CLI. For those of you who like the GUI, we're going to play around with the GUI this time. But to do that, we need to go ahead and set a profile or not a profile a password for our user. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we'll copy this command here. We'll go to our terminal and we'll type it in. Our username is security. Our password, what would be a secure password? I think a secure password is Hack smarter one, two, three, same password I use for my bank account. And we'll do profile Pwn labs. All right. And now we're going to log into the AWS council. Should pull that out to its own as well. So I can just flip tabs easily and we will log in with our user. And we need to get our, our 12 digit account ID. And the way we can get that is when we do this get caller identity, this is our 12 digit account ID right there. So I'm just going to copy that and we'll drop that in there. Our username, I believe was just security. And of course, hack smarter one, two, three. No, don't save password. And now we are logged into our AWS console. So let's jump back to the guided portion of this lab. Blah, blah, already logged in. US West 2, I think, because I said that is my default, we should be good. Yep. Oh, no, it's not. So let's change this to US West 2 there. In the, in the search bar, type access analyzer and click on the first result. Don't mind if I do. We can see that access analyzer is contained and part of the identity and access management service. We can use the analyzer to some of the things we already talked about, identify resources that are shared outside our zone of trust. So hey, if you have a public S3 bucket, this is gonna let you know. And identify IAM users and roles with assigned permissions that they do not use and could potentially be, be safe to remove. So we're gonna go ahead and create an analyzer. I don't wanna see your service menu, bro. No, no. All right, so we'll go ahead and do create analyzer here. And we're just gonna follow all the default stuff for external access analyzer. So this is gonna scan resources and tell us, hey, here are the resources that might be external facing that you may just wanna fix. <clears throat> Get a drink of water. <clears throat> Think all this other stuff is good and we'll do create analyzer. But you can see that's all that's guiding through, create analyzer. And now we're going to review findings. I believe this might take a little bit to populate. A minute or so. Let me get caught up on chat in the meantime. I'm missing some stuff on chat. Just good conversations about try hack me, hack the box. Pontel, I've never heard of Pontel Don Oreo Bite. How's YouTube going? Deadpool said, there's an option to increase the width of Notion that blew my brain. Thanks. I know. I. The silly thing, though, about Notion is from what I know, you cannot set it globally. So every time I create a new page or I don't know if that's what they're called in Notion, a note in Notion, I have to reset the width, which is just silly to me. I should be able to do it automatically, in my opinion. Why do I not see comments from LinkedIn? So I see on LinkedIn, there's four comments, but I can't see any of the comments. Freaking LinkedIn. If anyone from LinkedIn staff is watching this, fix your buggy platform. For those of you on LinkedIn, if you left a comment and I don't respond to you, it's because LinkedIn sucks at doing live streams and I can't see the comments. So, so silly. All right. Come on, I believe in you. Let's back out. 
Maybe maybe we just need to let it chill. Oh, did it throw me in the wrong region? Hold up. Like it's zoomed two in. Access analyzer. And let's drop this back to US West 2. Come on. I believe in you. Do it. There we go. Now we have it. So now we can look at some of this before we even look at the walkthrough. If you're brand new, you might even be able to figure out what's going on here. So we have an S3 bucket. Now, if you don't know what an S3 bucket is, think about your traditional CTF when you discover FTP. When you discover FTP or port 21 on a traditional CTF, there's a few things you check. One of the first things you should check is number one, does this FTP server allow anonymous login? And if it does, you might be able to find sensitive information being stored in the FTP bucket. Well, that's the same with an S3 bucket. When you see an S3 bucket, the first thing you should ask is, does this S3 bucket allow anonymous login? Can anyone list the content and download the content? If it is, that's a pretty major vulnerability unless it's intended. Sometimes they will store or companies will store static websites through an S3 bucket, which is fine, but you don't want to be storing sensitive information in a public S3 bucket. There's a lot of breaches. I believe the Capital One breach was tied directly to this, but you can see we have a finding right here for this S3 bucket. All external principles, it means everyone can do write, they have write permissions, tag, and read list. So this bucket is totally public. We have uh, that same bucket right here, and the bucket ACL allows anyone to list it. We have uh, another bucket called customer data. Probably not a good idea to have that exposed, and it uh, looks like all principals can read and list that. We have an EC2 snapshot that uh, is connected to our account ID that anyone can read, uh, write, read, list, but only in, our, only in this specific account, or I think it's assigned to this account. That is our account. I'm not sure. We have an IM role that can write. So those are the findings, and we're gonna go through each one of these findings one by one and see if we can put on our blue team hat and remediate them. So starting at the top, we find a, uh, we see a finding related to our temp bucket. And of course, yours will be different than the one in the guide, and yours will also be different from mine. Every time you spin up a lab, it's gonna give you a different environment. And just like I said, it seems any AWS user in the world has access to perform any action on the bucket. So let's go ahead and check out this bucket. We can click, I believe, our finding ID here. And we will pop open our resource here. And for some reason, it reset my region. So let's go back to US West 2. And there is our bucket. We have Kate's access keys. Come on, Kate. Why are you throwing your access keys in a CSV? Step your game up. But let's go back to our bucket here. Here's our logistics temp bucket that we're modifying. We're probably going to go to permissions. Inside this folder are AWS access keys. That's what that emoji looks like. I love it. We need to address this issue straight away. In a real world environment, this is important, you would want to disable the exposed AWS access key. If it's exposed internet facing, you just want to assume someone has it, you need to disable it, rotate it, all that stuff. You want to identify the IAM user they belong to. Here it's pretty obvious, Kate and understand when the key has been used and what resources a user has been accessing. So you know, hey, have I been breached? We can assume that this part has already been done and we are now focusing on removing this access. Under bucket policy, we can click the edit button. That's right here. So one of the best things that you can understand about AWS is understand how to read these policies. So I'll edit here. But before we edit, let's understand what's going on here. This version is basically the same, but here's the statement, the part that matters. I don't, can I zoom in on this? Okay, I can zoom in a little bit for you guys. The effect is allow, so it's not deny. And principle, we have a wild card here, and that's a big issue. This is saying anyone. And even people outside of our AWS account, the principal, anyone, this applies to anyone. So anyone is allowed to do any action, another wild card here. So any action to the S3 bucket. So anyone, right? Anyone is allowed 
to do any action to the S3 bucket and specifically to this resource right here, another wild card. So we can modify, read, delete any resource inside of this S3 bucket. That's what that policy is telling us. And we are going to modify that policy. Am I zoomed out? Sorry, if I'm zoomed in too much, it's going to break the, the editing when we're playing around with it. But we're going to add this and we'll just copy it copy and paste it and i'll do my best to explain what's going on here and we'll also have to update it so it matches our account but now with this updated one let's walk through what's going on here so we do have the same allow a thing but notice our principal is not a wild card that's a big change that you should draw your attention to. It's not a wild card. Instead, it's applying only to specific users in our AWS account, specifically the security user and the Kate user are then able to modify our S3 bucket. So it's not everyone, therefore it's no longer going to be internet facing. But now if you're following along in this lab, remember that your bucket name is going to be different and your account name or your account 12 digit ID is going to be different. So you do need to update those values. The easiest way to do that is we can just copy this for our bucket and we'll want to replace this name right here with our bucket name. And then for our account, if we have that right here and we'll just update our account. So it matches the account that we're working with in the lab and that should make it. So these are no longer internet facing. There we go. And if we go back to access analyzer and click rescan, rescan, there we go. We successfully resolved it. We put on our blue team hat and we saved a vulnerability from happening. We stopped our S3 bucket from being publicly exposed. So we did it. HunterBot said, open buckets are still a problem. I found a bucket that had 30,000 customer data in a bug bounty program. Dude, amazing and awesome find. HunterBot, how did you find it? If you don't mind me asking, did you use like um, that gray, gray warfare, whatever it's called to find buckets? Or were you just looking at what was in scope? Did you find a bucket in like source code and then see if you could list it? I'm just curious how you hunted that down. Or Shodan, I suppose. You could use Shodan as well. Maybe target the org. Leonardo said, wild streaming question. Have you ever dabbled in setting up ultra low latency in the YouTube stream? No. I don't know how. <laughs> I should. I think YouTube has the least delay, though, between the different platforms. What up, Hacky Notes? Good to have you here, my friend. All right. Well, we solved one issue. Congratulations. You can... Pat yourself on the back, but let's go to our access analyzer here and I'm going to zoom out so we can see everything and we'll change. We'll probably just refresh this real quick. It's not going to refresh. Can I go to all findings? Is it, yeah. So we have the one resolved beautiful. So we did successfully resolve that finding. And yep, I did all that. Next finding, let's click on the finding ID for the same bucket. We might as well do this and these tabs are already open. So here's the other finding we're gonna be messing with. This is the one is resolved, but we have this one affecting the same bucket that based on the bucket ACL, anyone can list content in the bucket. So as indicated above, we can see any valid AWS account, not just any AWS IAM user in the AWS account, but in any AWS account. So not a totally anonymous user, but someone with a different AWS account can do this, can, which is actually a very common misconfiguration you'll stumble across in the wild, can list the contents of our bucket. Click on the S3 bucket link as before, if the tab isn't still open, which we have that, and we'll go to here. We'll go to our temp bucket right here. We will go to permissions and ACL. Okay, cool. I want to see what Hunterbot said. So Hunterbot said I was navigating the InScope site and saw they hosted images through that bucket. So I navigated the bucket and saw I had directory listing enabled. Amazing. Like something that simple that a lot of people overlook. Congrats on finding that. Yeah, thank you, Leonardo. Send that over to me. I would love to check that out. All right, so here is our access control list, or our ACL for our bucket. And we can probably guess what we need to do. But if we look at that, we can see the problematic setting below, right there. 
No, this could be a legitimate setting, which is what I mentioned at the beginning. For example, if the bucket contained only data that was for public access, such as static website assets. However, in this case, the bucket shouldn't have been world readable or world writable, right? We have creds being stored there. Untick the everyone and click save changes. All right. And is this that finding? Let's rescan, rescan. And resolved, we have successfully resolved another finding, right? Give yourself a pat on the back. Congratulations. We're doing well with our blue team hat on so far. And if we just back out here, view active findings, I'm going to do all and, oh, that one's not resolved yet, but it will. It will. I, I believe it. It just takes some time. Oh, well, it will resolve itself, I promise. We see it resolved on that other window. Let's just move on. Do, do, do. All right, jumping back to the finding details and clicking rescan, we resolved another finding. I did that. Let's check out what seems to be a bucket related to customer data. And that is this one right here, which says all principles based on the pocket ball, pocket, bucket policy can read and list. So let's get that pulled up and we can go ahead and open up our customer data bucket there. Looking at the finding details, we see that any AWS user that is aware of the bucket name would be able to list and read the bucket contents. Assuming that only the user Francesco who adds and accesses customer data and security should have access, we can replace this policy with the policy below. Now let's not script kitty this. Let's understand, let's read through the broken policy so we know what's going on. All right, so we have once again, the allow statement, which has a wild card. So anyone is allowed to do two things, two actions on the S3 bucket. They can get an object, which means they can download and they can list the bucket. So exactly what HunterBot was just saying is uh, what he discovered in the real world was the fact that anything was world listable. Zero X Dar Smooth said, cheap viewers and followers on Streamboo. The frick dude, why would I pay for followers and viewers, homie? You silly person. Can I, uh, I don't even, I can't even, I can't even moderate you. You'll just have to just keep your spam there. It is what it is. <laughs> Too hard for me to moderate while I'm live streaming. I need to obviously handle. Oh wait, no, I got it. Restrict. And what else can I do? such a noob anyways zero x dar smooth i don't want your cheap viewers and freaking followers only scrubs are buying viewers and followers on twitch or youtube absolute silliness anyways back to the stream you can see that anyone is allowed to get objects and list objects and applies to this resource and with the wild card so any customer data they're able to do that too so what we are setting up if we look back at our lab We'll copy this in and then we'll read through it, make sure we understand what's going on so we're not just once again script kidding it. If I could type. Oh, maybe I should hit edit. Good job, Tyler. Learn how to use the computer. Okay, I apologize. This is really small. Let me zoom in for you a little bit. But now look at the difference here. We have our allow effect again, but notice we're not using the wild card. So that's the first fix. We're applying it to specific uh, AWS principles or users. We have our security user, which is the user we're logged in as now. And we have our Francesco user. And that's the person who accesses the customer data. And what actions are these two users allowed to do? Well, they can get objects, they can get stuff from the bucket, they can list it, and they can upload data, which makes sense. And it only applies to this customer resource right there. Now, a few changes we do need to make, like before, is our bucket name is going to be different than what's in the lab. So we'll grab our bucket name and just make sure we replace this with the proper bucket name. And we also want to grab our account ID from right there. Replace that. Save changes. Did it go through? I think so. And let's see if we remediated it. And it's resolved. Beautiful. 
we'll go back out to our buckets here in case we have more buckets to play around with. All right, so resolved, 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 and now we have this EC2 snapshot one. You know, actually, let's look at it ourselves. What is this saying it can do? So we have an external principle that has this access to our snapshots, it would appear, based on the finding. So organization access role. Oh, never mind. I'm at the wrong one. Let's go back to this and we'll close this out. They want us to do this one first. And so what's this one? External principle ID allows them to assume a role. All right. Actually, on checking the documentation or the cloud team internally, we find that this role is automatically created for any AWS account that is a member of an AWS org. It must be the NSA's backdoor. AWS Organizations is an account management service that allows businesses to consolidate multiple AWS accounts into an organization, which then share billing details and optionally also AWS credits and data with the NSA. And this also allows centralized management of resources. This configuration is intended and we can safely click archive and move on to the next finding. So clicking archive is like saying, hey, this is a false positive. You don't need to worry about that. All right. So we have one more, our EC2 snapshot one, which gives an external account access to our EC2, which seems like a violation of the principle of least privilege, unless it is there on purpose, right? Let's check our last finding. We see that it's an EC2 EBS not snapshot has been shared with the AWS account ID of a consultant. In this case, the snapshot contained infrastructure as code backups that might have contained sensitive credentials, so we should remove access. We can assume that the credits have already been rotated. Click on the resource URL. All right, click on the resource URL. All right, there it is. There's our shared account. I'm guessing just modify permissions. Select the snapshot and from the actions, oh, actions, okay. Click modify permissions. I could have done it from either page. And we're just gonna remove that person, right? Remove selected, let's double check. Remove selected, yeah. And we successfully resolved it. Let me double check. Let's see if everything is resolved. Go to our access analyzer. Right there. All right, if we go to all, you can see resolved, archived, resolved, resolved, resolved. So we successfully resolved all of the findings which were hardening AWS account. This would prevent an attacker or a pen tester from getting easy access to your account by looking at some of these things that are internet exposed or publicly accessible. We have resolved all the external access tests. We could also set up an unused access analyzer that identifies permissions that we could potentially remove in line with the principle of least privilege. Do I need to? Yeah, well, let's do it. So access analyzer, we go to I am unused access. Here we go. Create analyzer. And we'll create. All right. After creating the analyzer, we can wait some time for the first scan to kick off, which does take a little bit. This is a really useful service and given how critical I am is to cloud security, as we're staying on top of and applying the principle of least privilege throughout your environment where possible. I would assume in mature cloud organizations, they have a team that's doing this auditing on a regular basis. The, la the flag for this lab can be found in the now secure S3 bucket that holds customer data. All right, well, let's go ahead and get our flag, customer data, private, flag, 
and we just download it or open it. Either one would work. Apparently it's gonna open Visual Studio Code, kind of an overkill, but I dig it. And let's go ahead and drop our flag in there. And there we go. We just completed the Prevent Breaches with AWS IEM Access Analyzer Lab on Pwn Labs. A lot to say. Try to say that three times fast. But the cool thing about this lab is I've demonstrated a lot of ways that when S3 is misconfigured or an IEM role is misconfigured, an attacker is able to elevate their privileges or gain initial access into your environment. So by using IEM Access Analyzer on the blue team side of things, you can prevent an attacker like me from getting into your AWS environment. I would encourage you if you are on an AWS team that you have a team in place or a regular pattern in place where you're auditing these privileges and these roles, especially the external facing roles on a regular basis. Hey, hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one. Peace. All right. Now I'm just with you guys. Let's check out LinkedIn. I'm sure none of the comments are working as usual. Yep. Still have comments. Still can't see any of them because LinkedIn doesn't know how to do a live stream. Flint said that was fast. Yeah. We are going to do a much more challenging one that I haven't done. I, I, I started it and I didn't even make it past the first step yet. So like I said before, it's GCP or Google cloud platform. I have zero experience with Google cloud platform, but I always like to work on what I'm weakest at. So we're going to attempt this on our own and we're going to try to do it from a complete black box perspective and just like dive into the lab and see how we do. But let's take a five minute break and then we'll dive into things. So I'll get some music pulled up for y'all. I'm gonna get a drink of water, stand up for a little bit. Let's take a five minute break. And then, hey, maybe at the end of the five minutes, we'll, uh, we'll play some more Black Hoodie On music before we start. But five minute break, guys. Stand up, get a drink of water. I will be right back.
Don't know I wear a black hat Where's your sequel that a base? Let me grab that And all the people in the place saying play that Even if your password's hashed I'm gonna crack that Let me go and pass that back With the fast track We can think of stole a fast I got the hash cat Even if it doesn't last I'm gonna grab that Every kind of persistence And I will come back Responders gonna listen And I'll get that call back Someone tell Eminem I'll never fall flat Cause I'm like all of them I don't sound whack I can rap I can hack Yeah all that Cause I'm like all of them I don't sound whack I can rap, I can hack, yeah, all that Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Black hoodie on, black, black hoodie on Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Get your terminals up as we listen to the song Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Black hoodie on, black, black hoodie on Got the Cali booted up in my black hoodie on Get your terminals up as we listen to the song this verse is for the career coaches I really hope it hurts cause y'all are the real vultures You're lighting up your purse that doesn't fit our culture You're getting rich off the poor, you're a poser, I told ya If you're good, you don't need the cash Now you're gonna feel my wrath I just want you to see the fact That more than half these acts are just a money trap So I will trash in raps, I don't want none of that And I will smash with passion every scummy act If you react with madness, you can run it back And if you disagree, your thinking's incomplete Because they're preying on the noobs in our industry And here's what we can do to bring their misery We can make them feel accessible for you and me All the content that we make, we do for free Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Hack Smarter Live. I am your host, Tyler Ramsby. Hope you enjoyed the five-minute break. Got up, got a drink of water, all of that good stuff. Let's dive back into some hacking. Going to do a quick intro for YouTube. Then we'll attempt GGP. I have no idea, guys, if we're going to complete this lab. We might spend the rest of the night on this lab because I don't know what I'm doing. Here we go. 
Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna do something that's completely unfamiliar to me. We're going to attempt a GCP or glue, geez, I can't even say the name, a Google Cloud Platform Lab on Pwn Labs. Now, if you've never heard of Pwn Labs, you need to check it out. It is hands down the best platform for learning hands-on cloud security. They have labs that cover AWS, Azure, GCP. You probably see many of them featured in my YouTube channels, but one area that I don't have experience is GCP but I like to work on my weak areas. And here's the other thing, y'all. I'm going through this live. I haven't completed this lab yet. I did start it a little bit, but I didn't even make it past the initial part. So like I've done almost no part of this lab. We're gonna dive into it blind and uh, see how we do. So let's stumble through this together. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And here is our lab, escalate GCP privileges with implicit delegation. Let's go ahead and grab that and open up Notion here and we'll start another lab page for this. We'll do that, fix our width. So here we go and we'll jump back over to here. We have our scenario. So we'll go ahead and copy this and we'll do H1 scenario. So a GCP service account key has been found leaked on Pastebin after some time. And the client has asked for our help, hack smarter security, to identify the blast radius and potential impact of the compromised account. Our objective is to see if we can escalate privileges from the service account and access sensitive data. Well, most people probably can, but I don't know if I can because I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to GCP. We have our lab prerequisites, familiarity and basic Linux command line operations. Check. Familiarity with GCP IAM concepts. Not check. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use our learning outcomes kind of like as a roadmap. So we have an idea like here are our targets. I'm just going to call this our goals, right? Well, not, not like that though, Tyler, come on. Our goal is like that, and we'll just paste in our goals here. So this will guide us through. The first thing we need to figure out is this, second is this, third is this, and fourth is this. So that's gonna be kind of our goals as we work through this lab. And it begins with a leaked paste bin, which doesn't show it up here. Oh, does it, can I click that? Nope, so you have to scroll down to get that information. We're not gonna look at the full walkthrough. We're gonna try it on our own. But here is the leaked paste bin that they found. So let's copy this and we'll just do it uh, here. Maybe H2. And we can change this to JSON. All right, so that's the leaked information. So what do we? What information do we have here right away without knowing much about GCP? We know that this is a service account, so hopefully an account with more privileges than what's needed. We have a project ID, grproj1. We have a private key ID, a private key, a client email, a client ID, an auth URI, a token URI, an auth provider x509 cert, a client cert, and a universe domain. And we need to put this in a file on our machine. Just copy this. Let's go ahead and set up a new directory. Uh, make directory for GCP, CD GCP, and make directory for, should we just call it like sit delegation? And we'll do nano creds.json. So the first thing we need to do, which shoot, I wonder, I might have to pause it for you YouTube people. I wonder if I'm gonna have to update Cali. Let's go to how to install GCP CLI on Cali. So I don't even have this installed. So we have to go through this full process. We'll go to Debian Ubuntu. I'm gonna try not to update because it might take some time, but we'll, we'll just give it a shot. We'll follow the rest of these steps and see if we can figure it out. Flint said, are you more of a Nano or a Vim man? I'm not lead enough to be a Vim man. We'll spend the entire stream trying to get out of it. I use, I'm not even a Nano man. I'm a noob mouse pad man. I'm not as lead as the other streamers. Whoops. Was that even the right command? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, it was. 
So import the Google Cloud public key. All right, check. Add the Google Cloud CLI distribution URI as a package source. Okay, check. Update and install the Google Cloud CLI. We're going to try just this command. Well, no, I am going to have to update, aren't I? So it, it reads in my new repositories. Yep. All right. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. This is all part of the learning process, ladies and gentlemen. Is staring at our screen while it downloads packages. Hey, for those of you on YouTube, I will pause the video here and I'll meet you up when this is all done. For those of you on stream, well, you get to hang out with me some more. We could. Is this going to actually be done? Probably not. Let's go. Come on, Google Cloud CLI. All right, for those of you watching on YouTube, welcome back. We successfully installed the Google Cloud CLI. Honestly, it didn't take that long, but you didn't need to stare at me in the standalone video while our package is installed, but we do have it installed. Agent Logan said, what do you use for music on stream? I use YouTube. <laughs> Here, I'll drop you my playlist. When I have background music like that, it's just from this playlist that's copyright free on YouTube. So I dropped it in the comments. But now that we have it installed, we still need to figure out what the heck do we do with this, right? <laughs> what do we do with this? So the best way to figure that out, let's close out. What do we have here? Oh, here's from our previous labs. We can close those out. Might have to authenticate. Oh, no, we're good. What is this magic right here? Has something to do with GCP. Okay, contains, yep, we know what contains. Okay, how do I authenticate to the GCP CLI? Already installed it with this info. GPT fails, we'll have to read documentation, but we're going to try this. Okay. Okay, well, let's just go it step by step. So our project ID comes from right here, I think. GR proj1. And our application credentials, I just called them creds.json. So OK. 
Okay. Authenticate with Google Cloud CLI. Once you set up the environment of variables, you can use a G Cloud Auth Activate Service Account command to authenticate with the service account. Oh, sweet. Okay. Verify authentication. Verify the authenticated by running G Cloud Auth list. Hey, hey. Let's copy that for our notes. To GCP CLI. Change this back to bash. All right, I wanna document all this so that when I have to do this again, I actually have it documented in my notes. So we're authenticated. All right, check, what the frick do I do next? <laughs> um, enumerate IAM permissions in GCP. Okay. Well, that's just, you know, you think chat, chat GPT can help me with that? Sure, there's tools that do it automatically, but I want to see if we can manually figure it out. Okay. And we saved it as a Google project. Okay, well that gave us, that definitely gave us some information. Now I don't know what that information means, but it gave us information, ladies and gentlemen. It means something. And maybe if I just open up Notion. Where's Notion? Paste bin. Enumerating GCP IM. So, I don't even know what this means. We have bindings and we have members. We have a service account, internal web dev team, grproj1. What's our web dev, what's our account called? We're this, service1337. Oh, this is interesting. We have a service account user, Ian and Ayush. Bruh, this is so beyond me. But let's demonstrate the, the learning live and see if we can figure it out. If I just copy this. What is this wizardry now? So the bindings, this actually contains a list of IAM policy bindings where each binding specifies a role and the members associated with that role. Oh, am I not, why am I not using, okay, one second, guys. I thought I was using 4.0. Let me um, log in real quick and I'll go back to sharing my screen. I'm not going to use 3.5, although it seemed to be working fine. MFA. What does this output mean? Now we're using 4.0. So 
So each entry in their bindings lists a group of members and the role they are assigned. This role defines what permissions the members have. Members, these can be individual users, service accounts, or groups, which we kind of noticed. Roles are collections of permissions. These are predefined roles like roles editor, roles owner, and custom roles. Roles determine what action the members can perform on GCP resources. For example, owner grants extensive permission across all resources. Cloud SQL allows for interacting with the Cloud SQL database. And GR Proj one roles custom app dev role is a custom role created for needs within the project. I wonder if that's a role that we are going to attack. <clears throat> Let's look back at our notes here. We have that projects GR Proj one. Where's that role even at? Here we go. So we have this one, grproj1, custom roles. Jeez, I don't freaking know. <laughs> I might end up just having to look at the walkthrough. This is my account. Anything interesting based on that output? Okay. Yeah, that is what I want to do. So that's very similar to AWS, actually. <laughs> Bruh. Okay, invalid value for role ID. The role ID should not include projects or organizations prefix. <clears throat> Okay, we could read the docs, but we could also ask ChatGPT if they can help us. <laughs> yeah, there was a mistake. You should not include projects or organizations, but I freaking did that. Oh. So we dash dash project and then the role. Okay. Okay, sweet. We're getting somewhere. Included permissions. We can get roles. We can list roles. We can get the IAM policy of our service account. We can list service accounts. We can get uh, projects from the resource manager. We can get IAM policy. All right, let's just grab this. So I think I'm understanding what that all means. Yeah, I got that, bro. E tag is a marker for the version of the role. So allows, okay, yep, I understand that. Allows role to get IAM policy attached to a service account. Allows role to list all service accounts. Allows role to get information about the project. Allows role to get the IAM policy of the project. Given these permissions, it's set up primarily for tasks related to IAM policy viewing and management within the context of a front end development operations. It can view roles and service accounts, but does not have permissions to modify them, which is in line with good security practices. Hmm. But I don't want good security practices. 
Well, so if this is Tyler <laughs> telling the client, I'd be like, all right, you good. <laughs> uh, ChatGPT said, you're, you're using the right stuff. No, no worries here. But no, there's something here we can abuse. Would that be any different? So like attach policies? What the frick is my terminal? Oh, that actually doesn't do anything for me. Oh my goodness. Guys, I, I, don't, I actually, I legit don't know what to do. I'm so new to GCP. Enumerate IM permissions, move laterally by abusing implicit delegation. Let's just go like this. Okay. Can we already do that? Why the frick you freaking Twitch scrubs keep trying to spam me, bro? Get out of here, homie. <clears throat> Isn't this the syntax I just did? Oh, no, it's different. <sighs> Permission denied on resource or it may not exist. Okay. Let's look at like <clears throat> GCP IM enumeration GitHub. Okay, my own, or my own pen testing firm. That's an older script. Yeah, four years ago. This is also, oh, that's the same thing. Four years ago. I want to find something a little bit newer. What's this? Two main components. Download this release. Dev tags are current but not stable. do cp home tyler downloads okay how do i use it gcp okay available commands access token get access token for the specified service account Brute force, enumerate, ref. Environment, jeez. Okay, well let's do service account. Our 
project ID was this, right? Oh my goodness. Enumerate I am. Okay, we enumerated it. There's already information that we had. So I guess that's actually not that helpful. Unless there's other things we can do. And maybe we want to enumerate all. Maybe we want a brute force. Hmm. Zone, GCP service account. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think an access token would do much for us. It gives us one, but I don't know what that does for us. <laughs> well, we can at least save this to our syntax. Like, hey, a, a tool we can use. This is very confusing. Just because it's new. I mean, this is how AWS was to me too when I first started learning it. Actually, AWS is more confusing. But I don't know, guys. I don't think I can totally CTF my way through this one. Anyone have any ideas of what I might be missing? Or some other things I should try? We have to use, I mean, we know we have to use implicit delegation. Move laterally by abusing implicit delegation. Maybe there's something I'm missing here. GCP implicit. Yep, and there's uh, <laughs> Rana Security Labs at the forefront. This is where I work. So, okay, let's just, let's try this Privest scanner. Scan the enumer. Well, see, I don't really know if we have. Have anything here. Let's try it. We got nothing to lose. We're learning. Oh, wait. CD implicit. Okay, project ID is this right here. Oh, <laughs> that's where that access token comes in handy apparently. So CLM. GCP, and we want to pass it our service account dot JSON. All right, I'm going to grab that access token. Okay. 
Oh shoot, okay, so it actually got some information there. Oops. What? Okay. Okay, so service account, it's not our service account. Is that us? Are we G? No, that's, what's our service account name? Our service account is SV1337. Right, SV1. Well, I don't think our account's included in that. The heck, y'all? If we had one of those, we could use one of these exploit scripts, but it doesn't appear as vulnerable to any of those. Jeez, GCP, y'all. Whole nother beast. Let me. We're, we're just gonna, I'm gonna stop struggling. You don't know what you don't know. I don't know if there's anything else to really check here. I'm sure someone who knows GCP, it's like super obvious, but not for me. <sighs> Let's go through the walkthrough and see. <laughs> See how many things I'm missing here. All right, so the first thing they did was list the different service accounts, which I think I did, or I did something similar. Let's try viewing the individual permissions of specific accounts. We can do this either at the project or individual service account level. And doing this at the project level can make it a bit more difficult to visualize and understand due to the number of identity and role bindings. Let's check the roles and permissions of our current user, which I did. Okay, so I'm not completely out of it. I was doing the right thing up to this point. This account has a binding for custom front end app dev rule. Check the permissions. All right, so, so far so good, y'all. I actually did all this stuff right up to this point. I just don't get how we can abuse this. We only have permissions to list service accounts and view the IAM policies. Yeah, exactly. Instead, let's examine some other IAM policies in the GCP project. Starting with service account SV2, that might be related to our compromise account in some way. But how would it be related? Maybe just guessing based on the name? Okay, so then we have to do, then we have to list the roles. And we have a custom role 736. Examine the permissions associated with the role. So it's G Cloud IAM roles describe a custom role, and then we specify the project. Oh, it has the implicit delegation role. So we need to switch over to this account. The frick would you do that? Let me just think. Hmm. Our current account doesn't have any permissions besides listing stuff. Does it have access to secrets somehow? Like, is there secrets we can dump that then gives us access to this role? Like, and this is more interesting. Custom role grants a dangerous permission implicit delegation that allows SV1. Oh, wait, what? It allows us to execute commands as that without explicit consent. I got you. 
so we can execute because of the implicit delegation, that right there allows us with our current role to execute commands as this other role. Implicit delegation allows one user or service account to perform actions on behalf of another user or service account without needing explicit consent. This capability is often used in scenarios where an application needs access to GCP resources on behalf of another identity. Such resources could be anything from cloud storage buckets to compute engine instances VMs. Next, let's check the IAM roles and permissions of SV3 service account. So we're just going through the SVs. So that has a service account token creator. And I'm guessing the next thing we need to do is, you know, understand that account. So we do roles describe service account token creator like that. Nope, I'm doing that wrong. Oh, do I need the I am? No. Get I am policy. Okay, more interesting. So it seems that SV2 can create access tokens for the service account. Wait, what? Guys, GCP is confusing. All right, so if I, I need like a diagram so I can track this. This allows SV1 to execute commands as SV2. Okay. In this role, oh, I see, because it has, I see, it's the bindings. That's what I'm, that's what I'm missing. Ah, that's what I'm missing this whole time. So if we look at the original one right here, it says members. So this is kind of like principles in AWS. Like when we were looking, remember when we were looking at the AWS policies in our previous lab, it would show this principle can do this on an S3 bucket. So in GCP, this is kind of like the principle. So the member, so this applies to this service account. And that is our service account that we have access to on SV2. So our service account can perform a custom role targeting SV2. Then we enumerated, hey, what is that custom role? And it's implicit delegation, which means we can run commands as SV2. Okay, got it. That part makes sense in my head. And now we have this G Cloud IAM service account. So this is SV3 now. And the members of this custom role is our SV2 service account. So our SV2 service account, which we can execute commands as, as SV1 inception here, has this role. Is this just like a default role in GCP? So the service account user role lets a principal attach a service account to a resource. When the code running on that resource needs to authenticate, it can get credentials for the attached service account. Okay. Can I? I've never created diagrams in Notion. Can I create like a diagram here? Board view, table view. Maybe I can't make like a diagram. Oh, what is all this? I don't know what this insanity is. I'm sure one of these can make a diagram for me. All right, we're going to do my own diagram. I just want to type this out so I understand a little bit about what is going on. So we have this service account, 
which is our our current one that we have access to, right? I'm just going to call it SV SV1, right? SV1 our current role. SV2 our SV2 So what the would be like SV1 executes a command as SV2 that generates an access token to impersonate SV3. I think that's the general attack path it's trying to teach us here, if I'm understanding this um, logic properly. Jason said, this is way rougher than my class tonight. Yeah, dude. Kua said, wanted to drop in and show some love for the Black Hoodie song. You speak truth. Thank you for what you do. New to Cyber was a developer before. Awesome, man. Yeah. I got my Cali booted up in my Black Hoodie on. Black Hoodie on. Black, Black Hoodie on. Thank you, my friend. I do my own sound effects because I don't know how to set up sound effects. So um, <laughs> I'll just wrap my own. But I think that's the attack path. If I could diagram that out, that's what it would look like. Let's see if I'm right. More interesting still. Okay, yeah, create access tokens. Yep, so I noticed that. We can exploit this configuration to escalate privileges from the service account to S3.3 by leveraging the implicit delegation create token privileges. All right, so my thinking is spot. Man. I was even looking at the right blog. All right, y'all. <laughs> the funniest part about this is I am a pen tester at Rhino Security Labs. So we're going to look at my blog post, not my blog post. I didn't write it. And this actually was the blog post I was looking at. So before we get started, access tokens, let's just read through this. One last thing before jumping to each method. The scripts for each method require an access token from GCP to authenticate. To fetch an access token for a gcloud CLI authenticated user, you can run the following command. And that's our access token for our service account. First and most exciting Privesk method. Deployment manager deploy create. This permission is probably the most simple yet powerful method of privest that we have found in GCP. This single permission lets you launch new deployments of resources into GCP as a project number at cloud services, gserviceaccount.com service account, <clears throat> which by default is granted the editor role on the project. The kicker is that the IAM service account act as permission, touched on in more detail below, is not required, even though you're essentially acting as that service account. This is reported to the Google Bug Bounty program, but we were told it is working as intended and as a feature of the service. Of course it is. Deployment Manager allows you to specify resources to create and configure in your projects in YAML or Jinja format. It basically can be viewed as an infrastructure as code service similar to cloud formation in AWS. The resources we specify use the permissions granted to that service account rather than our own user. So this isn't the one we're exploiting, but it is similar or it is interesting. Let's look at some of these IAM based methods and here is what we can do, right? This is the role our one user has, right? If I look at Notion, can generate auth tokens. This permission allows you to request an access token that belongs to a specified service account. We can escalate privileges by requesting an access token for a service account that has more privileges than us. The following screenshot shows an example of it where the IAM credentials API is targeted to generate a new token. You can even specify the associated scopes for this token. The exploit script for this method can be found here. How do we target a user? Here. 
or not Python 3. So if I look at this, we need our access token. Oh, it's going to ask us. Yeah, okay. We're going to have some issues because these are older Python scripts. We might have to do it manually, maybe. Yeah probably an older feature of a Python library. How about, okay, implicit. So we need to abuse both of these. As a service account, you may not necessarily need IAM service accounts to get access token, get access token for another service account. This is the first thing we need to abuse, right? We need to abuse this to get to SV2 or whatever. I don't feel like typing out this. Okay. Nano see if we can fix it. <clears throat> and maybe, maybe if I can fix this, I'll do a pull request and I'm at work tomorrow to, to update this actual script in our GitHub. Curious what it changed. So they added the authorization header. Cat's hanging out as usual. Those of you who join the stream on a regular basis, you know about the hacker cat. He's going to start meowing, I'm sure, because I'm not petting him. See if I can see comments on LinkedIn yet. Nope, still can't see comments. Silly LinkedIn. Chill out, cat. Enter the email of the service account you have implicit delegation on. That would be SV2 or whatever. Oh, where the frick is the name of it though? Oh, did I not have it up above? Dang it. Do I need to get... Oh, is it just... I think it's just this, but the SV2. So I'm going to copy this. Oh, it doesn't even take it properly. Okay. Enter the email of the target service account that the previous account can create access to. Wait, what? 
Enter the email of the server's account you have implicit delegation on. Enter the email of the target server's account that the previous account, that's a very confusing wording. Enter the email of the target server's account that the previous account. What the frick? I don't think JadGPT understood what was going on here. Peace out, Angular. Thank you for hanging out, my friend. Service account you can delegate. Target service account. So service account I can delegate. Target service account. So is this my service account? I think so. So this would actually be my service account, I think. We'll find out. And then this one going to be two. And then our access token. This right here. Not found for URL. It is correct. Incorrect service account email was. Oh, my email was incorrect. It is. It is a different email. So SV two. This is actually the SV two email. I think that's the issue. Okay. So we'll copy this. And now. Maybe SV2 now, and we can give it our authentication. Forbidden for URL. Jeez. Okay, we're looking at the walkthrough. Yes, yeah, so that's our exact attack. Service account A can get an access token for service account C via implicit delegation. Service B. Oh, wait. Maybe I'm thinking of this wrong, actually. So we need service. <laughs> this is so confusing, y'all. We need these two service accounts. My access token is functioning as me, I think. So email the service account you have implicit delegation on. That's going to be this one. Email the target service account. That's going to be this one. And then our access token. That's going to be this one. Freaking did it. What? Amazing. How do I use it now? can't believe that worked. We'll 
do. I'm going to play around with that script manually and make it look a little bit neater later, but we at least got the script working. And we were able to get our access token. Now, if I can just figure out how to authenticate properly. Oh, I just need, okay. Once I do that, how do I auth? How do I like enumerate stuff? Is it just the GH, like the commands I was running before? Well, I don't. Yeah, that's not what I did. If we look back at my notes. Like, can I run some of these enumeration commands now? Okay, so that'll show us which accounts were authenticated as. Oh, I'm still... How do I switch it? You just told me, bro, you're the one who told me to do gcloud auth. <laughs> okay. Obviously, there's probably an easier way to do it. Let's just see the proper way to do it. We at least got the attack to work. So they did the curl command. Okay, so then they're validating it that way. All right. Well, screw it, I'll just copy the whole thing, that's fine. So then it's valid. So we'll drop down here, update a script. What do you want, cat? Now we could use a tool such as GCP IAM brute to brute force IAM permissions. Although in our scenario, we'd actually have permissions to directly enumerate the IAM policies for any IAM user in the project. Let's showcase this tool as permissions to list IAM permissions are less likely to have been granted in real life. Can I use the tool I already have? So like we already have this weird tool right here. Well, <laughs> come on, Tyler, what are you doing? Um, so with this GCP, we can give it our access token. All right. Gosh dang it. Come on, Tyler. Having issues. Access token. 
and then we'll grab this access token right there. And then we can brute force. Oh yeah, I guess that's important, isn't it? GR proj one. So with this account, we can list cloud functions and we can, what are you doing cat? Why are you chewing on the table? You psycho. You have food, go eat your food, not my table. Seriously, go to sleep. Anyways, we can list cloud functions. You know, let's go ahead and just copy this. I'm gonna include in our notes and we'll say, enumerate GCP I am, attack path, updated script, Dude, now he's eating my wall. Don't. Brute forcing permissions. And so with this, we could just figure out how to do each one of these things. So I'm guessing maybe the flag is in like a storage object. I don't even know how to list storage objects. So let's ask ChatGPT. Guys, I might have to go throw my cat away. What are you doing? Stop. Okay, <laughs> just knocking crap off my desk. Freaking classic, classic cat. Stop. Bruh. Cats. What is he doing? <laughs> Stop. No. Get off my desk. Sorry, guys. Okay, but how do we pass it? Can this tool do it? Hold up, can this tool do it? This tool might be able to enumerate it. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Can it enumerate objects? Or buckets? Maybe not. Although cloud function is one of the things, right? Stop. Yeah, I could do cloud functions. Let's try enumerating cloud functions. Ah, I don't know. Why do I you always ask? Well, just save it, bruh. Don't ask me that question. I don't remember what the project name is. GR Proj One. Oh, it doesn't actually enumerate cloud functions. It just tells me my permissions. It's not actually dumping it at all. Okay. Although I could probably figure this out. Let's just look at the walkthrough. Oh, I didn't. Okay, we do have permissions related to cloud functions. So we have to do it all on the command line via curl. It has to be a better way to, like is there not a Python script that does that for us? Can I not authenticate automatically with the access token and then use the GCP CLI? I suppose it's just a standard URL, like if you knew what it was. Let's see if ChatGPT would have been able to help me with that. Yeah, you already said that, you freaking robot. OK, 
Okay, so let's try that. So this would be my access token right here. Seriously, I'm going to get rid of my cat. If anyone want to buy a cat, I will sell you my cat for free. I'll Actually, I'll pay you. I'll pay you to take my cat. What is he doing? Anyways, this worked. So we have a function right here called function one. We have a trigger, secure always. We have a GitHub webhook with this bucket viewer service account email. And we have an upload URL for Cloud Function App Spot. Not entirely sure what this all means, but let's go ahead and grab the syntax here. And we'll bring it over to our notes. <clears throat> Cloud Functions. And the other thing I want to know is how about buckets? Because I noticed we could also list buckets. So it's storage V1B. And then do we just pass that? Oh, and then we pass it our project ID. that jump back to my terminal oh what what permissions did I have storage objects to get right Store, oh, objects. I need objects. I'm getting objects and buckets confused. Do I need an... Okay, so I need to know the name of the bucket. Did that say what bucket I had access to? Is it... This bucket right... Oh. Or can I... D What's this? I wonder if that's what we're actually aiming for, is this .zip file that we're going to download. You know what? Enough of me just experimenting. Let's figure it out. I feel like this recording... Yeah, we're already over an hour. We'll just kind of look through what I'm missing. Reveals a function naming function one. Yep, and we can download the function code, it looks like. Go cloud function code gets stored in the Google Cloud Storage account. Although we currently don't know the exact bucket name, it's worth noting that GCP uses a predictable naming format for cloud function buckets. The bucket naming format is GCF, sources, build number, and region. So ours would be GCF, sources, don't see a build number the build number included above with build name key is it that and then our region okay I see let's grab that for our notes <clears throat> And we'll just call it like so just so I can write this out myself, it'd be GCF sources. The build number would be right here. And then um, 
and then region us central one which comes from right there and now with that information if we go back to the gpt command i was playing around with would something like, here, I'm just gonna go to my thing right here. My cat's going crazy, I don't know what he's doing. Whoops. It's totally not what I copied, but whatever. What the heck? It's not what I'm copying, freaking Is there a reason I can't copy this? Copy. What the frick notion? Thank you. Then we'll give it our access token from before. Y'all, this is some confusing stuff, but this is how we learn. We don't give up. We keep powering through. Shoot, did it work? It looks like it. Do not delete the bucket. <laughs> Self link, media link, name, do not delete the bucket. MD5 hash, time created, storage object. ID, media link, blah, blah. Okay, well, we somehow got the bucket. Wow, all right. Okay, yeah, we did all that, we did all that. Oh, so now we're, how are you downloading this? We can now extract the source code and inspect it using Google Storage's API, we downloaded the file. Wait, how did he? Oh, is it the media? No, how? How do they put together this URL? So I get the Google APIs, download storage, V1, B, GCF sources. Is that in the output of that, our command we were running before? GCF sources, US Central, do not delete. Download GSE, do not delete generation media. But we want function source dot zip. I just didn't see that when I was looking at it. Oh, I think I see it. I see what they're looking at. Is it right here? GCF forces. This is where they're grabbing it from, aren't they? This URL right here. If it will let me copy this properly without freaking out like that. Okay, there's some things I've noticed about Notion I don't like. Like, why? I just want to copy this line right there, that URL. But if I try to copy it, it copies all the freaking code. Trash notion. Going back to cherry tree. Just kidding. Not yet. But there is, that's what they are grabbing, right?
Okay, now let's ask ChatGPT so I'm not just following the guide. I want to make sure I'd be able to figure this out on my own with ChatGPT's help. I suppose it'd just be W get and you pass it the access token. Basically what we're already doing. And then we're specifying output file. Let's try it this way. Function source. Oh, finally. <laughs> wow. What a process. But man, I sure learned a lot in that process. Let me grab this. And we'll jump back out to Notion. Let's finish off our notes. Downloading. Downloading the source code, locating the flag. That was a cool, really cool lab. I liked it. It was quite complex, at least for me, for someone who's new to um, GCP. But this is one of the reasons I really like Pwn Labs. If this is like a hack the box approach where it was just like a black box, give me an IP, give me the starting point, I would have rage quit way back here just because I'm so new to GCP. And I can say, well, read the docs, figure it out, which is one thing, but like the best way I learn is by doing these hands-on labs. And so I'm so grateful that there was this detailed walkthrough that kind of walked us through as we were stuck even ended up at my own pen testing firm's blog to figure out the, the privilege method. And I think what I'm going to do is what I do like about Notion is I can easily share my notes. So when I drop this standalone video on YouTube, I will drop a link to these notes in the description of the video. For all of you watching right now, I will give you these notes. I think, well, I don't know if I can. Because I think some of these, I don't know if this is all regenerated every time. So it may give you access to the lab when you shouldn't have access. So maybe I won't, I'll, maybe I'll clean up these notes and I'll drop in the standalone video. So things are restricted. I mean, the only things I'd have to restrict are some of this initial stuff. We'll just go like this. That should honestly be good enough. If someone wants to take the time from type it out of the video, you know, more power to them. They can have fun doing that. I think the rest of it is good. Yeah, because all my access tokens will expire. All right, let me just grab this. We'll publish it. Grab the link. Let's see. Let's view the site. I'm not going to pay for a special URL. But there, now, if you guys want, you watch me make these notes. You can have the notes for this lab and in the standalone video, I will also share it. And then you have my full notes from when I was working through this lab. And hopefully you find that helpful on your own GCP journey. You can add this to your overall pen testing notes. And then if you ever run into GCP, you can refer back to them. But wow, incredible lab. As always, GCP, or not GCP, Pwn Labs is an incredible platform. We have the further reading here. Let's understand some of the defense 
The leaky service key aside, in this scenario, a threat actor would have been able to leverage legitimate, although potentially dangerous, permissions. As mentioned, it is really important to keep track of who has been assigned these permissions and to monitor for their use. Permissions assignments are shifting sands, changing all the time, so probably it's worth monitoring and keeping track of the permissions that could easily lead to lateral and vertical movement within a GCP and general cloud environment. Which remember, y'all, the lab that we did just before this one, at least on stream, was using IEM Access Analyzer and AWS to do this very thing. As a blue teamer, it's worth taking a purple approach and periodically assessing the security of your infrastructure through simulated breaches such as this, in addition to periodic penetration testing to help with understanding the blast radius of various accounts were they to be compromised. Honestly, incredible lab. Pwn Labs is an incredible platform. Oh, I didn't even enter my flag. Let me at least get credit for doing this lab and drop my flag in there. But... I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun. We're at, what, an hour and 20 minutes of working through this lab. And this is a milestone, guys. This is my first ever GCP lab that I have completed, and you were here for the journey. So I shared this before, but it's true. The, the purpose of this live stream is me just sharing with you what I'm learning and hoping you benefit from the troubleshooting, the methodology, and we learn some of this content together. So for those of you watching live, thank you for hanging out. For those of you watching After the Effect on YouTube, thank you as well for you for taking the time to go through this lab with me. And hey, I will see you in the next one. All right, y'all, I have been on for three hours. Now I think I'm gonna call it a night. But I uh, truly do appreciate all of you taking the time to hang out. Cat's on my lap. Cat, you guys say hi to my cat. He always tries to make some type of appearance. Here he is. What? Why are you all wet? What did you do? What are you, silly cat. I think he spilled his water on himself. Crazy, crazy cat. But all right, guys. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I will see you guys in the next one.